So today's webinar is called The Amazing Life of the Atlantic Salmon at Sea by Ken Whelan. Welcome to IFI's webinar for Go Fishing Week. Today we have Professor Ken Whelan, who will tell us about the amazing life of the Atlantic salmon at sea. Ken runs his own fisheries consultancy and over his career, he has worked for several fisheries research and management organizations in Ireland, including the Inland Fisheries Trust, Central Fisheries Board and the Marine Institute. Ken has been a keen angler since a very young age and has written extensively on angling topics. So welcome again, Ken. It's great having you here today. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. I'm really looking forward to bringing yourself and our viewers on a tour of the North Atlantic. You're all very welcome to this really uh, natural history talk on the amazing life of the Atlantic salmon at sea. It's surprising to think that for perhaps more than a hundred years now, we've been actively involved in carrying out research on Atlantic salmon. But only very recently have we begun to unravel the quite extraordinary life of the Atlantic salmon at sea. To understand the biology of the salmon at sea and how the salmon itself sees itself as a sea fish, you really have to go back and look at the ancient ancestry of the salmon. And it surprises a lot of people to realize that the original of the species, Eosalmo driftwoodensis, as he was called, um, he existed about 40 million years ago. And both the fossil record and indeed more and more molecular data that we're retrieving indicates that the genera Salmo, which is the Atlantic salmon and all of its cousins, the brown trout, etc., and the genus Oncorhynchus, which is the Pacific salmon, and again, all of the Pacific salmon relatives, that they had diverged uh, sometime between 15 and 20 million years ago. And by that time, uh, we could identify then clearly, if we were around, Atlantic salmon from the five Pacific species. So this divergence happened a very, very long number of years ago. But we're thinking more in terms of ice ages. And if you ask anybody about the most recent ice age, everybody will say, oh, 10,000 years, because that has been really in, uh, ingrained in our minds from the time we were at school. And even though that's not a bad approximation for the end of the Ice Age, the Ice Age, the most recent one, began about 27,000 years ago. And certainly when I was at school, it was very convenient for the teachers to be able to show little bits of Ireland that were free of ice, because that saved them the embarrassment of the awkward questions. Um, if it was all covered in ice, how did all the animals and plants that we have in Ireland, how did they get back to Ireland? And of course, that was saved by the fact that these refugia existed. But in fact, the refugia did not exist, at least for parts of the period when Britain and Ireland were covered in ice, the two islands were completely covered in ice. And certainly um, the only remaining areas that would have been above the ice were probably the peaks of the highest uh, of the highest mountains. And evidence for all of this is really to be found along the continental shelf of the west coast of Scotland and Ireland. And the Marine Institute in Ireland and many of its colleagues over the last two decades or more, they've begun to actually find these remnants of the glacial moraines. So the same structures that you would find on land, these moraines are masses of rocks and sediment left by the toe of the glacier. And indeed the eskers, which are those beautiful rims uh, of um, gravel that we see running across the Irish Midland, Midlands, those eskers are present as well off the west coast, as are meltwater channels, and they can still be found to this very day. But the one thing to remember is that the Ice Age was not the Ice Age, it was the Ice Age and then it was thawing and then it was the Ice Age again. And this re-entrenchment of the ice on the landscape had a huge impact on the landscape in molding it. 
and the retreat of the ice from continental shelf edges, it began about 26,000 years ago and had variable rates of retreat in various locations. We know that ice sheets began to retreat from their southern extremities in the Scilly Isles in the south of England around 23 to 20,000 years ago, while it was not until much later, 19,000 to 15,000 years ago, before the ice began to retreat along the eastern English coastline. So you can see that reflected in the genetics of the salmon populations that we're looking at today, because they clearly indicate different invasions at different times. And that's an important point, and we'll come back to that a little later on. But back to the core question, the question the schoolboy or schoolgirl is going to ask, really, how did these animals and plants get back into Ireland? Well, certainly in the context of freshwater species, we now know that there's very clear evidence for these giant paleo flows, absolutely massive movements of fresh water that moved up along our east and our west coast at various times. And very high paleo flows, more than, more than an order of magnitude greater than present day flood peaks, they characterize the milder periods of the post-glacial epoch. So at times we had what we now would consider very, very major climate change impacts happening. And we know that the fresh water occurred as a result of high rainfall, of glacial outwash, of snow melt and melting permafrost. And if you think about those massive great movements of fresh water, it is obvious that they give potentially, they give a route for fresh water uh, invertebrates and freshwater fish to be washed up into the what we now know as the estuaries of our rivers and our streams. We also have very clear evidence of very dilute seas. And what many people don't realize is that trapped between the southeast southwest land bridge and the ice sheets far to the north, that the Irish Sea at one stage, this is the sea off the east coast of Ireland, was filled with water, forming a massive freshwater lake. And even more surprising, far to the north, we know in the North Sea itself between 20,000 years ago and 18,000 years ago, that a large freshwater glacial lake occupied an area of the Southern North Sea. So just think about it. And this is the speculative part of this talk. Um, think about salmon in those sorts of environments. And it has been suggested that salmon may very well have evolved taking advantage of these very dilute seas. And it may have been that they were in essence what we would call inverted commas sea fish. In fact, they were really giant estuarine fish, but let's call them sea fish. And they were spawning perhaps in the marine gravel sediments in much the same way as say herring do today. But with the retreat of the ice, what we saw were the formation of glacial streams. And think about it again, when the salmon found these glacial streams, they might have nosed into them and began to deposit their eggs in the glacial streams. And why would they do that? And why would that be selected for genetically? Well, perhaps, perhaps they found in these small little streams a very safe haven for their young. And this gave that particular variety of salmon a selection advantage. Some years ago, when I was working in Greenland, um, I had an amazing conversation with one of the local biologists who explained to me that when the salmon were appearing off the coast of Greenland for the first time, having migrated across from, North Atlantic, from the uh, north of Europe, that the salmon very often arrived in or around the same time. And that even though the salmon arrived at in or around the same time, very often the food sources that we associate with feeding salmon at sea, small fish, um, squid and so on, they mightn't be about. And these fish are really good at scavenging. And at times he has caught salmon that were full of small snails where they'd actually been feeding quite in, uh, quite in close to the cliffs and to the rocky shorelines of that particular area of Southwest uh, Greenland. And one suggestion I would make, when salmon leave our rivers, are they really leaving home? Or is in fact home where they're heading for, because perhaps originally they came from the area 
where they're now heading back to to feed as adults. And that, I always think that's a fascinating thought. Even at this stage, are we quite sure where home is for these salmons? So just to give you an idea in terms of the map of Greenland where I'm speaking about. So this area here off the southwest coast of Greenland is an area where our salmon feed. And right in the center here is this little town of Cockertuck, where scientists are often stationed when they go to work on our feeding salmon and salmon in general from uh, Scotland and from Ireland uh, in, the, uh, in the Greenland area. So the distances that the fish are traveling uh, in order to make the, their feeding grounds are truly enormous. So from the mouth of the Arif, for example, to the grilse feeding grounds off the, North, off the uh, Norwegian coast, that's about 1800 kilometers. And from the little town where the scientists are based, Cockertuck in southwest Greenland, to the mouth of the Moy is 2700 kilometers in a straight line. And we know that salmon don't travel in straight lines because of the fact that they're foraging. So they are moving very, very far distances. So the little smolt then that's going to see, how do they make these journeys? Well, we could spend all of today's talk uh, um, discussing migration patterns, but I just want to introduce this just so that you will see how the smolts make their way to and from these locations, the location where they're born to the location where they're feeding and back again. And perhaps six or eight weeks before they actually make their way to sea, these smolts begin to uh, imprint. And this is done, we know now, by laying down layers of chemical taste or smell in the brain. So if you think of a little uh, salmon par at the very top of the earth, that little par is experiencing the smell or the taste of the river um, way, up in Delf or way up in the Delphi Valley somewhere. And as that little fish travels downstream, the new layer of chemical smell or taste is laid down in its brain. And then it uses, basically, it's using a GPS system then to get back to its spawning area when it reaches the mouth, mouth of the river. But at sea itself, it's using electromagnetic orientation, the same as the birds. So these little two-year-old smolts, when they're making their way out to sea, their physiology is extraordinarily different to when they're resident in freshwater. And they are changing into sea fish. Again, we get this transformation from freshwater to saltwater. And the physiology almost impels the fish to head for the ocean. They are really, really uncomfortable in freshwater. And when we see them jumping and scuttering around on the surface of the uh, rivers, when they're heading to sea in May, we might, might be thinking, wow, they're really glad to be heading out to the sea. But that's not the case. In reality, they are seriously uncomfortable because they need to make it to what I would claim to be their ancestral home as quickly as possible. And once they get into the ocean then, they move very fast um, through the bays and the near shore. They need to migrate from the river mouth to their feeding grounds. Uh, and certainly I'll show you now an animation showing how just how perilous this particular journey can be. We know from salmon returns that the smolts that went to sea in 2002, for example, did extraordinarily well, while the fish that migrated in 2008 showed a very poor adult return. And um, so the migration pattern of these fish at sea, in addition to following the actual smell or taste of the fresh water and the electromagnetic cues in salt water, they also then have to navigate all sorts of different currents. And a lot of these currents are actually regulated by the surface currents. And that may very well be the key to a lot of the mystery that surrounds the migration patterns of salmon at sea. When they move into these currents that are moving north, um, and very often it's north to northeast because initially at least, most of our smolts seem to head for the feeding grounds just here off northwest uh, um, Norway. When the fish are moving in those currents at an early stage, when they're very small, remember they're no more than about maybe 12 to 15 centimeters. At that stage, they're almost trapped inside these currents. Yes, they can roam within the currents, 
yes, they feed avidly within these currents, but they really find it difficult to make anything other than movements within the currents. But as we'll see later, they can change currents. But once they get to the feeding ground and they have fed very well during the summer, once they reach about 750 grams in the late autumn or early winter, they become powerful enough to be masters of roaming the very surface layers of the ocean themselves. They mature over winter, some of these fish, and as they mature, they then head back down towards the Faroe Islands, down in this area here, and they overwinter in the Faroes, and then they come back um, to the Irish coast and back into us as, um, as grills. But the fish that don't mature, they head from the Norwegian coast across then to Greenland. We don't know their pathway, but it is assumed at this stage that they probably head across uh, uh, over the top of northern Iceland into East Greenland and around the corner into, uh, into West Greenland. We do know that there are three or four really important areas, small feeding areas, if you like, at sea that we have now identified. So this Norwegian sea area, this area here in the Barents Sea, which caters for a lot of the Russian fish, and some of the northern Norwegian fish. Um, the Irminger Sea seems to be really important for those fine fish that you find in Iceland. But we know that in the Labrador Sea here off southwest uh, Greenland, that certainly for Irish fish and for Scottish fish, that's a key area. But they're joined by fish from North America and for fish from Canada and the US. This is the predominant area where they feed. So these particular blocks in the ocean are really, really, really important. And the movement of the fish to and from those blocks, in essence, regulates the adult returns that anglers may expect to see. So this is the little animation that I talked to you about a little earlier. And as you watch the animation, imagine this is really a computer game. So what this is, this is a computer generated um, um, image of what might happen to 10,000 simulated smolts, particles really in our model. If we release 10,000 of these off the Donegal coast, and if we let them then run according to the model, which is uh, generated by putting in all the data that we have in relation to surface currents, in relation to wind, and in relation to the actual speed of smolts. And if you watch the dates as they come up, the computer game is to try and get to this area here as quickly as possible. And you will see because of the surface currents running in the right direction, and because of the wind that's influencing that running in the right direction from, the, uh, from south to north along this particular transect here, you'll see that they get to this particular area quite early in the summer, by late, Ju by late June or July, the fish in 2002 are feeding here. Whereas in contrast, in uh, 2008, you will see that very quickly, because of prevailing winds uh, from this particular direction here, from the northeast, and the change in surface currents, you see the fish get very, very spread out across the ocean, according to the model, and are quite late reading, reaching the feeding area. So um, during the big Salsi program, when this model was generated by my Norwegian colleagues, it was hypothesized that this might very well be one of the features that regulates whether or not that particular year class is going to become successful. So initially the model will actually sh show some confusion in this area because of all the different nearshore currents, but then finally the smolts are heading off and they're heading up by the west coast of Scotland. Remember they're heading for this area here, but look in 2008, their direction has changed. They're beginning to actually mass around the Faroes. They're beginning at the next stage, they get spread out towards Iceland. Whereas these particular smolts are showing that they are going to be in place feeding strongly by early July. And I just let the model run. Now, in reality, it becomes unrealistic because the fish get caught in gyres and feed in this area. The current obviously carries on through in terms of the model. But I just want to show you just how distributed these particular smolts are potentially across the ocean. They're in zones where generally they're not going to find the food that they're looking for. 
The other thing we do know is that, and this really surprised us when we discovered this particular piece of knowledge, that at times the smolts actually have to change current in order to, meet, uh, to reach these feeding grounds. So if they're heading directly north here in the North Atlantic Drift, which is the really what, what is commonly known as the Gulf Stream, if they get to this location here, which is called the Weibel Thompson Ridge, they really do have to switch over currents in order to get to their feeding area, or else they'll be swept across and into the um, Icelandic area. It may very well be that in the context of springfish, that some of the smolts held directly across to Greenland. But at the moment, we think that most smolts feed for the first summer in this area. And then, as I said earlier, in terms of early winter, they then make a decision whether they're going to mature or not. If they're going to mature, they come back down towards the Faroes, over winter in the Faroes. And if they're not going to mature, then they head across then towards uh, Greenland. We found out some other very interesting features as well when we did the research in the Big Salsi program. And that was that these smolts quite like uh, reasonably warm water. Between nine and 12 degrees was the ideal temperature for the smolts to, to grow in. Um, and certainly changes in those temperatures, the sea surface temperature changes that we could see under climate change could have an impact. The other thing that was really interesting, given that the fish have come from freshwater, they have made the full, the full transition to salt water and they prefer full salt water, 35% uh, parts per thousand rather of uh, salt is what, they, is what they prefer. So the non-maturing uh, salmon then head for the west coast of Greenland, as we said earlier. Um, they're going to spend one, two, or in some cases for really, really large yeah. salmon, they could spend three years feeding off the west coast of Greenland and then back to their rivers to spawn. And those electromagnetic cues are so important to them coming across the open ocean. But once they get close to the co coast, then the smell or taste then clicks in. And remember what we mentioned earlier, the fact that all of these smell or taste layers are in the brain. So obviously as the a small salmon or indeed the case of the Greenland fish, the bigger salmon, as they reach the coast, they will get the taste of the estuary or the near shore first. And they will unravel that layer on layer on layer in their brain as they move upstream into the very area where they themselves were spawned. One thing to remember is that even under natural conditions, there is a relatively high straying rate. The straying rate can vary from anything from 8% to 10%. In many ways, that must give, must give us hope for the future. Because at present, salmon populations are under pressure. We all know the pressure that they are under. And these fish are looking to see how they can adapt and how they can adapt in an efficient way. And that ability to be able to stray is providing them with an option. For example, in Greenland at the moment, there are some areas in Greenland where there is now very little ice at parts of, at, at parts of the year. And there are these small new glacial streams beginning to appear. And as these glacial streams are beginning to appear in Greenland, they are becoming colonized with char. And we know from the records that we have that the char were the first invaders of these glacial streams. Perhaps, just perhaps in the future, some of our straying Atlantic salmon where we may begin to recolonize those streams in Greenland. But what about the future for our salmon populations? Because our salmon populations are in areas that are going to be hard hit by climate change, where it's relatively warm. And the question is, have salmon the ability to adapt to these fast changing conditions in the ocean and in freshwater? Well, I would have great hope for salmon. I have absolutely no doubt that Atlantic salmon will adapt. I have no doubt that they will uh, continue to exist. But the real $100 million question is, where will they exist? because we really, really do need to start putting together mitigation measures in the southernmost areas of the salmon's distribution. So if you're in England or in Scotland, or if you're in Ireland, we really have to think how we can actually protect these creatures and how we can make sure that they do have uh, the opportunity to adapt. And certainly I will leave you with this message. I think the key to salmon conservation is the provision of 
space, time, and cold water. They're the three ingredients that these absolutely magical creatures will require if they're actually in a position to adapt and to be able to provide us with these uh, wonderful fish for many, many years to come. So many thanks, Ken, for these really interesting insights in the Atlantic salmon's life at sea. Um, many anglers, probably like, like myself, or salmon anglers think we have a fairly good understanding of the salmon's life cycle. And that's probably true uh, with regard to the freshwater end of things. But for me, this whole thing, what happens at sea, uh, is still, uh, after this talk, probably not so much, but was definitely a big black box. Yeah, it, it's extraordinary, Marcus, because when I was working in Greenland, the first time I was working in Greenland, I realized that the salmon were so close to where I was in Cockertock. And when I was fishing in the evening, I actually saw the fish jumping quite near to the rocks. So when my Danish friend told me about them feeding on snails, I could see why because they're actually in really little channels. You, you imagine they're way out in the ocean, but caught in these little bays, there's an enormous amount of squid. Certainly the year I was there was full of squid and all of the salmon that were caught by the uh, subsistence fishermen, their tummies were distended with squid, baby, little baby squid, maybe about 10 or 12 centimeters long. So that was fine, fine food for them. But it blew my mind completely because they're obviously just so adaptable and they're so comfortable in those little bays. It certainly was a very different experience. Yeah, that they seem to be quite opportunistic. I mean, imagining that they feed on snails, it's just incredible for me. So, I mean, you assume, yeah, okay, they remember what they were feeding on when you tie a shrimp fly, but uh, who would uh, imagine tying a, a snail imitation? And fishing it in the ocean which would be more, more extraordinary. Now, generally, when it, uh, the way it works is that each uh, member of the community in Greenland has a subsistence allocation in terms of salmon. So they're, they're allowed, I think that chap told me, I think it was 10 fish or something was allowed for the whole year. Um, so um, he was able to, as a biologist, monitor what they were feeding on. It was only the very odd year they wouldn't be feeding on squid or these small little fish they call capelin. But there were years when the salmon arrived, despite the fact that the father fish hadn't arrived. And that, that really made me think. I would never have imagined that possible. I would have thought of the salmon as chasing the father fish and their arrival was due to the presence of the father fish. It wasn't. And then I kept saying to myself, I wonder, are they going home? And the idea that they would leave Ireland knowing where they were going in Greenland, it was amazing. Just amazing to think of that. And I, in, in terms of, how, how much of their life they spend at sea, the older the salmon become, the greater the proportion of their life they spend in the ocean. And for a multi-sea winter salmon that may have spawned twice, that fish will have spent more of its life in salt water than in fresh water. And yet all of our knowledge, as I said earlier, is confined to fresh water and the very early and very late stages in the estuary. And outside of that, until about maybe 10 or 12 years ago, we knew so little. I do need to emphasize that my talk was very much speculative. And I just, I just like to do that to get people discussing and talking about these things. There's lots of theories about salmon. Some theories are that they developed in freshwater, but certainly for me, the idea of them um, appearing first in those very dilute seas, it's, there's something very satisfying about that particular sequence of events that I find very attractive. Yeah, you definitely got, got me thinking now. Um, I think the question is uh, what you said about uh, where is home? Uh, it's, it's, besides being a scientific question, it's, it's almost a philosophical question, I think. Yes, it is, yeah. And yeah. the thing is that that then, it puts it on a different plane for that, uh, for that very reason, because mm -hmm. we have it all sorted in our minds and as humans, we're transposing into their minds the idea that where the eggs are laid is home. No, where the legs are laid, are laid is safe. That may not necessarily in their mind be home. And uh, just to finish, there was a, a friend of mine, Fred Worski, um, who's a really brilliant scientist. He, he now does a lot of tracking in the ocean. But when Fred was working on salmon, he started to tag both smolts and kelts that had survived spawning in Canada. And what he found was on several occasions, he found that the kelts 
uh, waited for two to three weeks feeding near shore until the smolts went to sea. And he posed the question at one stage, are the adults waiting on the smolts to show them the way? And that really is an amazing thought. You know, there's no science to back that up, but it's a fantastic thing to discuss when you're having a pint. Absolutely, Ken. And uh, what I will uh, take with me after this talk is that there is hope and that it's about space, time and cold water, as you said. And uh, this big strain rate uh, is definitely uh, makes me looking hopefully into the future. And uh, I'll, I'll just hope uh, that uh, I will probably see you soon somewhere on the water uh, in the very near future. Thank you, Marcus, indeed. Thank you so much, Ken.